Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this daily conversation around various aspects of the COVID-19 crisis and everything that's happening in the news. We're doing a series that we call the Stony Brook Journalism Episodes. My students at Stony Brook School of Journalism are producing several episodes of the show as part of their digital innovations in journalism course that I teach. Tonight, the episode is produced by Kelly Alvarado, Cameron Albert, Jonathan Bonilla, and Nikki Nasiri. Kelly and Nikki will be with us as co-hosts, and you'll meet them in just a minute. Our topic tonight is indigenous wildfire strategy to understand what's been happening with the terrible wildfires out west. And we will have folks who can tell us how Native American tribes and people and individuals are handling the fires and also what can be done to make the situation better for everyone involved. We'll have two guests with us. Daniel Wildcat is a professor at Haskell Indian Nations University, co-director of the Haskell Environmental Research Study Center, and Bill Chip, director of natural resources and environmental policy at the Karuk Tribe Department of Natural Resources. Bill is on Twitter. He's at Cultural Fire. So please do follow him and you'll meet Bill and the professor in a few minutes. Hello, everyone. I'm Sri. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for all your support of this show. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and the co-founder of Digimentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. We are so grateful that you're watching us. Hope you will tag us right now and tag your friends so they can watch live. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So if you tag your friends on any of these platforms or hit reshare or hit retweet, then your friends can watch now or later. We want to tell you a little bit about the show. In our first 215 episodes, we've had more than a million viewers and 156 million social impressions, 386 guests 68 from 68 cities and 20 countries, including the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. We are so grateful to all of you for watching. You can also subscribe and see the archives at youtube.com slash 3 We are in partnership with Scroll Global and Scroll.in. Our producers are Rose Horowitz at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon. We're also grateful to our sponsors who make all of this possible. So are you ready to talk about this important topic? and to understand what's happening. Please tell us where you're watching from and please post your questions so that our guests can answer them. So first, let me bring on our student co-hosts who will talk to me for a minute and then we'll bring on our guests. So let me say hello to Nikki and Kelly. Hi folks. Hi Professor. Uh, great to see you. Tell me how you're, how you're doing and how you came up with this topic and uh, how what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, yeah, so it was kind of a group effort. Um, we really thought this was an important topic, and um, uh, Indigenous People's Day just passed, so we thought it was pretty timely, too. Um, and yeah, we just thought it was a really important conversation that needed to be had. Um, and yeah, that's how we chose it together. <laughs> and I'm also doing good. If, if and where, where are you, Kelly? Um, I'm in Deer Park, uh, Long Island. Um, okay. Currently in my mom's basement. <laughs> okay, I can, I can see that. But it's a nice basement, so that's yeah. good. Let's go to Nikki. Nikki, where are you? Hi, um, I'm in East Otago, Long Island, just 10 minutes away from Stony Brook University. All right. So are you ready to bring on Bill Tripp, who's going to yep. talk to us? And we'll go from there. So let's uh, first say hello to Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for being here. You're near the Oregon border of California. Uh, my first question to you is how are you? Where exactly are you? And how has your family been handling the pandemic? We'll talk about the fires and everything else. Um, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, I'm um, in the extreme northwestern uh, part of, of uh, California. Um, just just over the first mountain range from the coast uh, in in the Klamath River Basin, and um, 
Yeah, this uh, pandemic has really been something. Um, you know, it's uh, ever since uh, going into to shelter in place um, so many months ago. Um, you know, we're we're still kind of kind of in that mode, except for except for I'm, I'm back in the the office now. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm a little bit of an introvert naturally, so so it doesn't affect me as so so bad as as, as uh, probably does some others. Well, we're going to find out all about your job and how you do it, and I'm sure you love being out in the forest and in, in nature rather than in the office talking to us. So we're very grateful to you for being with us here tonight. I'm going to turn this over to my fabulous students who are going to uh, be in charge of the questions for a little while, and then I'll come back. So uh, thank you, Kelly and Nikki, and I'm going to step aside right now. All right, so let's get started. So, Bill, could you tell us a little bit about your job and what you do every day? Well, I'm the Director of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy for the Karuk Tribes Department of Natural Resources. Um, and um, I've only been in this position for a couple of months, and so I'm in transition. Um, for quite a few years, I've been uh, the Deputy Director of, of Ecocultural Revitalization uh, for the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, my my primary focus was was in in the in the realm of um, of fire um, and um, and you know environmental education workforce development strategies uh, food security food sovereignty uh, collaborative stewardship um, and um, kind of kind of that realm a um, little bit of K through 12 environmental education. Uh, but now I, I, uh, I have a broader focus um, that um, I'm still still kind of reeling to, to catch up with. Um, but uh, you know, a good portion of the summer, I've I've been um, kind of all consumed by COVID-19 response, and um, and you know later on the uh, response to uh, one of the large wildfire incidents in our Aboriginal territory. Yeah, so how, how is that being out on the field trying to control that? Well, it's been an interesting uh, emergency assignment, really. Um, I did most of my engagement remotely this time. Um, I'm used to being um, right in fire camp, um, you know, working with the incident commanders and the fire behavior analysts and the the operations folks and the planning folks to, um, you know, um, to consult on uh, all of the details around um, how how the incident is is managed, um, and and uh, make sure that we're protect protecting our uh, cultural resources um, within within our territory. But uh, it's been interesting trying to work uh, remotely. Um, is is you know I'm, I've uh, got my computer open and so I have a lot of distraction there, um, but then um, I'm also uh, not able to engage uh, that well, um, and so but but we've we've developed a really good team on on the the with the um, in partnership with the Six Rivers National Forest uh, Heritage Resource Program um, staff and. Um, and uh, so they've been used to, to working together for a few years. And so that's, that's really helped. You know, we've been able to have morning calls and, and talk over issues and then they can get a day, the ones that go out in the field and, and uh, make sure that um, things are protected. Um, and we've, we've been able to go an extra step in getting more ceremonial leaders and cultural practitioners involved um, early on to make sure that uh, people with local specific knowledge are able to um, to identify those things and, and make sure they're protected as well. So for the people at home that may not know how controlled fires work, can you explain that a little bit for us? Um, so there's um, a couple of distinctions. Um, you know, I, a lot of people say, uh, call them controlled burns. Um, some people call them prescribed fires, um, and there's cultural burns. 
Um, you know, I've always was, uh, I was taught that uh, you really, as a, as a human in this world, not really controlled, can control very much. <laughs> and, and if you want to think you are, then, then you're probably going to get proven different uh, eventually. And so, um, so I don't like to, to claim that any, anybody can actually be in control of anything, especially fire. Um, but, um, but, um, you know, with a prescribed fire, you know, you, you typically go out there and you cut a, a fire line like you would with a, um, uh, with a fire suppression effort. Um, and except for in, in a suppression mode, um, you're cutting a fire line and burning out away from it. Whereas in a prescribed fire, you're cutting a fire line and you're burning inside that burn, confining it. Uh, to a, a known a known space, um, and so um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of fire trucks and hand tools and and um, you know, no mix and personal protective equipment involved. Um, a lot of uh, regimented training that you have to go through to be able to lead or even participate in in such a such a thing. Um, you know, with cultural burning, it's um, you know I, I, I view that as, as having some some distinctions that are are, are worth noting. Is is um, you know um, our people burned um, in this place for for millennia, and you know worked with the weather and the the conditions on the ground, and the sequencing of our actions to uh, to be able to do this without you know leather boots with five room soles and, and, uh, and all this fancy stuff we have today, um, you know, using moisture gradients and just knowing, you know, sometimes it's just the smell in the air tells you it's time to light this fire in this place and, and it's not going to go anywhere. And um, other than, than right there where you want it to stay. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's a, there's a whole lot to it, but, um, but uh, that's, that's a, a quick, quick summary, I guess, of the differences. Um, so how does, can, uh, how does cultural fires uh, prevent mega fires from happening? Like how would it help California and what they're dealing with right now? Well, um, you know, it's, it, it, it becomes a matter of scale. Um, if we're thinking we're going to go out and burn 400 acres a year and have a, a, on a 1.2 million acre landscape and uh, think we're going to make any difference, um, we're, we're fooling ourselves. Um, you know, we've, we've really got to think quite a bit bigger than that. Um, and, um, and we've got to figure out how to, to, to do that together. Uh, none of us can do it alone. You know, if the if the agencies that are responsible for suppressing fires think that they're going to be the ones that have, that are going to do it all, um, then they're going to quickly find that there there's no way that they can do it all because they're going to be suppressing fires, suppressing fires in Southern California when we need to be lighting fires in Northern California, and and um, and so people are already learning that. Um, but you know, when you go through and do a prescribed burn, um, you get to pick uh, what conditions um, you're gonna gonna burn in, and um, and so you know, if we we can get to the point to where we can go out here and actually take advantage of some of these large fires that just happened, uh, some of which um, have done actually had some benefits. Um, in reducing the fuels and, and uh, happen during weather conditions that that actually um, produced surprisingly beneficial results. Um, you know, of course, the ones that happened during those major wind events like the Slater fire uh, that burned, uh, grew like 90,000 acres in a 12 hour period and burned down 50% of, of Happy Camp. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the fire that burns um, in those windows of time that are just uh, horribly devastating. And so if we could get out into those places, we know that the, that the winds uh, out of the Northeast that come with high pressure systems um, are um, you know, you know, 
in, as we move into the fall, um, we know that those um, those those conditions are the high probability, high impact event. And so, if we can get out there and uh, and start to reinitiate this patchwork of burning, I'm used to do um, as as indigenous uh, being indigenous to place. Um, it um, then then we can have areas where where lightning fires bump into um, that um, that don't for for enough uh, fuel to, to build up um, heat and and um, and build up enough uh, you know flames to a spot two miles out and you know start a start just this massive um, area um, that's igniting all at once and just growing um, un, uh, uncontrollably. So on the side, we were just sharing your article, our land was taken, but we still hold the knowledge of how to stop mega fires. Um, can you tell us what pushed you to write that article? Well, um, I, I got a phone call <laughs> ask, asking, uh, Asking if um, if I would uh, be interviewed uh, by the Guardian um, about um, my experiences uh, with fire, and um, and I, I it had just so happened I I just got done um, with a 14-day assignment on the Red Salmon Complex um, in in the Trinity Alps uh, wilderness. And um, and I was a little bit frustrated uh, because with COVID nineteen, um, all of the work we've done to um, to kind of start to change the paradigm uh, to be able to use fire um, the right way and herd fire around and and uh, put fire into places to cut cut the fire progression off and all of these things. Um, managing intensities and how it burns um, that this year was was no longer um, no longer the type of the thing that was in the Forest services decision space and so they were told you're not going to get any people if if unless you do a full on suppression strategy well the um, the area where the red salmon complex was burning. This is this is the fourth event that has happened up there in the past 21 years. Um, you know, with an average cost of 61 million dollars a piece um, at that time. Uh, that average has now gone up. Um, but um, you know, I was I was frustrated um, by by. Um, just the way way things were going on, and my inability to really engage due to COVID nineteen, and was it doing everything remotely, and um, and um, and so you know, I just I started to put together a two thousand word um, blog um, that I was gonna gonna try to get published, um, and. Um, that, that was talking about the uh, the ironies of the situation, you know, with uh, you know, Red Cap, uh, you know, the Red Salmon and Red Cap Creek, and Salmon Summit, and our staple food sources, and all these things, and just the the ironies of just the name alone, and 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 what it does uh, to Indigenous peoples, what this whole question has done to to our people um, in this place, it, it just became uh, an emotional flood of, of um, just conversation <laughs> topics, and 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 so I I put it down into a, basically a two thousand word rant um, that I was planning on adjusting later when I calmed down, and and when I got a, got the call about um, being interviewed, I uh, said, well, you know, maybe something like this, and so I sent them my my rant, and 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 they said, wow, there's really something here. I don't think I can do this justice with a um, with just an interview, and so they asked me if I would submit an, an op-ed um, and and uh, knock it down to to about a thousand words. And so you know a lot of a lot of that emotion and a lot of the ironies and and some of those those other details you know had to be removed uh, to get it get it knocked down 
to to that thousand words. But overall, you know, it uh, I think it turned out to be a, a really great piece, and and uh, they said it got more attention than any other thing that they published on the fire so far. Wow. Um. So how do these fires work? Like, how does it start, and how do you ensure that it stays like somewhat controlled? And burning where you want it to. Uh, what's that again? Uh, so how do you like basically control these fires and like make sure it doesn't go farther than where you want it to? Well, um, you know, these days they, you know, they go out there with bulldozers and uh, fire trucks and hand crews and um, and put uh, big old fire lines in um, and. Um, a lot of these places, you know, this is such rugged mountainous country um, that these are a lot of these places uh, go through sacred places that, that are sacred to the Kudu people, and um, and and uh, get impacted. Um, and so traditionally, um, you know, we didn't have any of those things, and so we did it with fire. You know, we would go out there and we would have somebody that would be out there, you know, hunting or something or, or making their, their prayers, you know, up in some of those places is like our cathedral or our church and uh, where we go to, to make our prayers and, and, and those types of things. And, um, and so, you know, some of these places uh, that we call prayer seats um are out there um, on these ridge systems um that, that um, we've had intentionally damaged before during fire events uh, because we identified where they were um but um but it, it's really hard to talk about you know because when you let people know where there are things are some some sometimes you never know if someone's gonna just go damage it because they know now or if they're actually going to protect it and um, so uh, we try to try to weigh that balance, but you know, we would we would historically be using these these prayer seats to sit there and watch and pray and wait for our indicators, and um, you know, reflect on on the world and life and everything our people need, um, and and that the world needs, and and when those indicators showed themselves, we would uh, light light the fire. And, and it would, and, and then, you know, the, the weather changes and, and the conditions are right and, and, um, and things burn until into a weather event and then go out. And so, you know, you, you do that across the landscape on these ridge systems on a, on a ro reasonable ro ro rotation. Then when lightning fires occur, uh, there's no fuel to burn when it hits the ridge. And so you don't, I mean, it's the same concept of putting in a three blade wide dozer line there's no fuel. Well, this is a whole upper third slope with no fuel. And so, so you know, even a, a, wind, you know, a wind event isn't going to stop, a dose line isn't going to stop it from a wind event. But a large, you know, you know 10,000 acre burn that just happened a year ago uh, will. And so, um, so, you know, our current practices are failing. Uh, well, at least the current practices that are being employed, employed for fire suppression are failing. And, um, and so being able to use uh, for, you know, enabling us to re, re, um, revitalize our indigenous practices, I, I believe, are, is, is, the, is the future solution that uh, we need to start, uh, start integrating um, into our, our working relationships. So what are some of the hurdles between um, like your tribe and California state between integrating your traditional practices into this larger program? Well, um, you know, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I, you know, being, being in a, um, being raised in in uh, my ancestral village um, of Wunkarak down there on the Salmon River, um, um, in in the same place that we've been for millennia, um, and and watching and growing up with real, without any real neighbors and and just really growing up in in 
in the continuum of, um, of our indigenous uh, knowledge, practice, and belief systems. Um, uh, coming coming out and seeing the the world um, as it uh, really is after growing up like that um, is difficult. Um, you know, it, it doesn't leave a lot of room for trust. Um, that uh, that integration doesn't mean taking the next thing away. And so sometimes it makes it hard to even talk in public about these things uh, because, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, we want to see a knowledge transfer. Well, yeah, the knowledge transfer is the, from the people whose land you stole to the people who stole it so they can do what uh, what what they believe is, is right uh, uh, and throw away what they believe is wrong and, um, and use it uh, for their own economic self-interest. And, and um, so, um, you know, I, 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 get, I get hung up on words sometimes, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's when I say integration, I, I, I really mean um, us all working together um, and revitalizing um, our indigenous uh, place um, under our indigenous authorities as sovereigns in, in, in our territorial homelands. Um, so have your tribes done cultural burnings like throughout your lives? Like, have you done it while you were younger too? How do I know? Oh, can you repeat that again? Sorry. So I just want to know if you were, if you have done like cultural burnings throughout your life, like, um, have you started at a young age or anything? Yeah, I, um, when I was four years old, I was sitting by the uh, stove waiting for my great grandmother to wake up, and um, I was cracking acorns and and um, probably not being quite as quiet as I thought thought I was. <laughs> it's cracking acorns, it's quite quite loud. Um, but um, you know, it's kind of chilly, so I, I I was sitting there by the stove and I thought I'd start a fire so so she'd be warm when she woke up and. And um, so she was, you know, she was over 100, 100 years old um, at the time, and and a full-blooded cutter. And um, and she uh, she came out and saw me trying to build that fire, and she told me she said that if I was going to be playing with fire, then I'm going to do something good with it. And and so uh, she took me out um, under the. Um, the black oak leaves up in the hazel patch um, and um, told me to, to hand me a box of stick matches and said burn the line from there to there and um, you know it, it took me that whole box of matches and um, and uh, you know just to, to get there but I did it and you know it took a good part of the day just laying there on my stomach uh, rearranging the fuels and uh, trying to figure out how to light things in a different pattern to where they would actually draw themselves together because I just did not, didn't have enough resources to actually take it from here to here um, in, its, in its current condition without rearranging things. And, and so uh, it was a really interesting first lesson in fire uh, because I was actually able to understand what it is and how it behaves with its environment on a micro scale. And, um, and so that, that started my education um, about all of the, 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 our uh, creation stories and, and uh, things that, you know, at, at first sometimes seem like just a bunch of animals doing funny things. Um, but, you know, as you grow up, those lessons come back to you in your practice. And so, you know, we talk about uh, revitalizing um, indigenous knowledge or transferring an indigenous knowledge, it's not necessarily possible. These things come out of the, they're they're born they're born in practice, and, and they don't they don't continue without practice. And so, you know, I guess I've been fortunate enough to be one of the few that got some of those stories as a young person. Um, you know, there are people all across the country that that uh, there are a lot of indigenous uh, peoples that have have people in the same situation or they have people that have had this information passed on. Um, and, and if those people are enabled uh, to put this back into practice, then, then they can start pulling, pulling the lessons um, back out of it 
and and uh, I think that we're we're in a time when, when that's that's really super uh, hypercritical that, that we go there. Can you tell us a little bit more about fire's cultural significance? Well, in Cudic culture, it's um, you know it's it's central to to a lot of things. Um, you know we. You know, we burn for a lot of different reasons, um, you know, both sacred and utilitarian. And so, you know, we uh, use it for heating, we use it for cooking, you know, it's like, the, uh, you know, I mean, really, our life depends on it. And um, at, at the most foundational level, and and I, I don't think that that's, you know, true only for colored people, I think that's for humans. Um, you know, we may use fire and an electric stove now, but it's it's still still the same thing, right? We uh, we need we need that heat. Um, we we need something that does that in our lives, and and so um, the um, you know it's a, I think it's one of the most foundational uh, elements that we've had, we've been um, as humans uh, put in a position to to build build a relationship with. Um, you know, for for going back farther than anyone can probably probably uh, recall or, or even find in, in any kind of a, a scientific record. So um, you know, we 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 uh, but aside from the utilitarian burning for our um, for enhancing our traditional food, uh, fiber, and and medicinal resources, um, and and enhancing hunting. Success and and all of these these uh, keeping balance in the ecosystem, food food webs in the ecosystem, and all these things. Um, we also have ceremonial burning practices um, that are supposed to serve as our reminder of of what um, what we're supposed to be doing um, as humans. And so there's one uh, short story I, I like to um, call back on um, that I've actually you know, had to get permission to, to tell um, because it's, it's one of those things that's a part of our annual world renewal ceremonies. Um, and some of these things aren't necessarily entirely for the public, um, even, even within the tribe uh, to know but um, a ceremonial leader determined that this in particular thing was something it was time uh, to start talking about. And so there's a, a day uh, during our world renewal ceremonies uh, down at a place we call Tishonic, um in Orleans. Um, it's at the mouth of Camp Creek uh, where our Fatoenan or um, I guess you'd call it a, a you know, sometimes we refer to it as a world renewal priest. I guess it's um, is um, one that walks one that walks the trails and, and does does that that thing for us um, that uh, nobody um, not everyone really really knows. <laughs> um, and so um, so he put he does a belly flop. And so this belly flop is um, supposed to make a lot of noise. And um, that noise represents uh, the clap of thunder, the lightning strikes. And so that creates a ripple that goes down the, the from the mouth of the Klamath River, or from the, the mouth of, it goes down the Klamath River from the mouth of Camp Creek. And so uh, that ripple is supposed to carry a prayer uh, to bring the salmon up the river. Well, this happens on a certain day uh, around the, new, the the full moon in August. So it's in summer, it's in the middle of fire season. And, um, and at the same time that that uh, belly flop occurs, um, the, the same indicator that that person watches for is something that that person at the top of Black Mountain, at the headwaters, of um, of uh, of Camp Creek uh, can key in on. So at the exact same time that that belly flop happens, 
and a loud noise happens, a fire's lit on the top of the mountain. And so, um, and, and so the, you look at the, the dynamics of fire on the landscape and what it does, it tells a really interesting story um, that, that, um, that, that takes, takes the, the uh, metaphysical uh, and, and uh, blends it with the biophysical and, um, and uh, shows you how a traditional knowledge practice and belief system uh, works in indigenous in indigenous uh, peoples, and so you know you look at what fire does. Um, it burns a small vegetation. It burns the leaves. It burns. It burns uh, the things that use the water that's close to the surface of the earth, and the soil moisture. Um, it, and then um, you look at what it also does. It produces smoke. Well, what does smoke do? Smoke interacts with the trees. So trees breathe, you know, over a 24 hour period or whatever. And, and um, you know, they take in um, carbon dioxide and they let out uh, oxygen. And so at night when the smoke settles into the, where the canopy of the trees are, it's the same time when they're taking in the carbon, right? And, and so, but with the smoke, you know, there's carbon but there's also particulates. And so the particulates get in there and they clog some of the holes. Well, when the trees pulling up, pulling up the water up at night and distributing it at the surface level, uh, bringing up that soil moisture so the tree can use it during the day, the, um, the tree doesn't need as much because it isn't evapotranspirating as much water anymore because of the smoke and the clocks, tomatoes and all that other type of stuff. And so, um, so that whole hydraulic redistribution process occurs, uh, but, but it, the evapotranspiration decreases. And so your surface, your soil moistures in, increase, your surface fuel moistures increase, um, there more water is allowed to, you know, that which then hampers fire behavior. And then more water goes down into your stream and your diurnal fluctuation in your stream would then change, creating a ripple coming out of the mouth of, of Camp Creek, <laughs> which, which um, you know, and then that combined with the smoke, shading the river and cooling the river temperature would then change the dynamics of the stream just enough to cue the salmon to come into the river and 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 come up spawn. And so, you know, it's it, it doesn't take, you know, it it's um it's those kind of things that um that have uh happened here for thousands and thousands of years um that uh, we really really want to see returned to our people. So there has been like a lot of cultural ties uh, for the controlled burns. Um, so, and I know that there has been some backlash um, of these fires. So how has this led to like cultural suppression? Well, um, our culture has been suppressed um, since, um, Well, I mean, I don't even know when to put an exact date on it since European contact, I guess. Um, and maybe even prior to that, they say the disease hit pretty hard even before um, a European contact uh, occurred. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's actually some interesting stuff that they found in the fire record, uh, looking at tree, um, tree uh, fire scars and trees and uh, looking at uh, pollen and um, and charcoal in in uh, lake sediments um, that you know fire behaved the same through changes in climate um, uh, coming out of the um, the last ice age and when when um, when the climate shifts alone should have moved the forest to a conifer dominated forest the forest instead shifted to 
a oak dominated forest because that produces more food for people and wildlife and it's a byproduct of the relationship human relationship of fire and so it proved an anthropogenic uh, or an indigenous uh, signal uh, in the way fire behaved across the landscape um, that was stable um, all the way up to um, the point in time when um, in the central sierras the spanish showed up then there was a marked change and so it's human human behavior has changed this thing and and here it's a little bit different um and uh, where we're at it wasn't the spanish that showed up it was the hudson bay fur traders so there's about a 40-year difference there uh which then just just uh you know makes it makes it even more more sound as, as far as a scientific study goes um but um you know there was another change during the gold rush and then another change uh, when fire suppression policy began and so um you know it's it's uh looking back into that study alone you know a person can say that you know there was probably an impact on cultural uses of fire uh, when european contact came into place but that was because more people were adopting the, or, or I guess, appropriating indigenous use, the concepts of indigenous use of fire for other reasons like cattle grazing um, and things like that. And so the fire was a little different and it created different, um, different feedback loops. Um, and, and then gold rush, um, you know, there was different um, reasons why people burned, burned off fire so they can you know, see see the different minerals on the ground or whatever reason they did it it was different and um and but then you know once the uh, fire suppression era started um you know it just that that bar graph took it right down to almost nothing until the point to where fuels were uh, built up so much um that that it just then took a curve like just straight up off the charts and so so um so yeah um the uh i think that the the cultural uses of fire were co-opted and uh, changed um a little bit before they actually ended up being uh, suppressed with the, the wholesale exclusion of fire um with the, the creation of the, the national forest uh, system and um and the 10 a.m policy So a lot of people at home, um, they see the, they've just been learning about these practices through social media and sharing online. So is there any way for just anyone that is in the U.S. to help you in any way? Um, yeah. Um, we're having a really hard time uh, maintaining our capacity um, to to um, stay, even stay in this discussion. And so one of the things that we've done is that we've um, we started to build this endowment for ecocultural revitalization. Um, and, you know, and we've started to work with um, state and federal um, agencies um, to, um, to create funding sources and uh, to develop partnerships and uh, so we can all start working together on this stuff. But you know, the, the, that's the issue with, with colonialism is, is that we're currently in the neo-colonial phase, uh, which maintains control of, of the colonized population because they control the financial systems um, that would enable indigenous peoples to have any kind of livelihood and so um that's kind of where we're at right now and so we're thinking that if we can build an endowment fund uh, that can give us um you know enough resources to say hey here's our two or three million dollars a year then um then where's your two or three million dollars a year and then we're all coming together on an equal playing field and and just doing great things together and so uh, we do have a click and pledge uh, link 
that we send around uh, for some of our endowment building efforts. And um, I, I, those are on my, my Twitter, Twitter feed and, and uh, those types of things. Hi, I'm sorry to step in. This is such a great conversation, and I, I've learned so much as 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 as, as uh, has our audience. Wanted to just uh, before we wrap up, Bill, if you can give us a couple of ideas for people who want to help. One would be, of course, to support the fund that you're you're raising money for. So everyone, please follow Bill at Cultural Fire. But anything else that we should we should know people who may have missed any part of this conversation. What are things that you wish everybody knew? Well, um, I wish everybody knew the importance of um, of uh, taking a socio-ecological resilience first approach uh, to this discussion. Um, you know, a lot of folks um, go straight to the economic aspects, and um, you know, there's. Um, you know, if, if, I think if people knew more about the, you know, the food web ecology out there in the ecosystems and how species can have these boon and bust population crashes as, as conditions change, um, you know, if, if, if people truly understood how that all works and how their relationship with fire could, um, could help maintain the, the balance for all to thrive. Um, I, th I think that we would we would all start moving to a, a pretty good place in this discussion. Thank you uh, very much. Let's go to our students and have them reflect on this conversation. Nikki, first you. Yeah, so I definitely learned so much and thank you so much for sharing those beautiful stories with us. Um, I feel so lucky to have heard them. Thank yeah, I wish, uh, wish Daniel was on. I, I was uh, excited to see that he was he was uh, part of this. So we'll have to bring him on another time. Uh, we're not sure, but uh, we're, we'll we'll ask him to come to join us again. Let's go to Kelly. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it, and it was so nice to have this conversation. Yeah, like Nikki said, I was really excited to hear all your stories that you had. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you tell us about those stones that are behind you on the on the windowsill? Oh, the um, the previous director uh, left left them here. Um, they're just some tools. One's a fire cracked rock, um, and the other ones are just some tools. But this this one here is one that was given to me by by a council member um, because. Uh, I needed to, to be a little little bolder in, in what I, what I do. So, so, um, so I keep it there to, to remind me to keep keep talking to folks. So. Well, you're very kind to have spent the spent the uh, all this time with us. What is your message for folks who aren't paying enough attention to Native American issues, including us? I've got to say, I've done 200 episodes. We've done one other episode about Native Americans. Uh, what is your message to the media and to the public that doesn't pay enough attention? Well, I think um, I think when people say that indigenous peoples um, are a forgotten race, I think that that's um, entirely true. Um, I've been working for about 27 years at the Department of Natural Resources here, and as a blonde indigenous person, I've been in the middle of rooms uh, that uh, people didn't think there was an indigenous voice and and um, heard some crazy things, um, uh, very upsetting things. Uh, but but what's even more shocking is is that um, you can talk to people in most places in this country um, and you know bring up the fact that there are tribes that need to be part of the discussion and this and that and they'll be quick to agree uh, but then they'll get into a conversation two minutes later and say yeah we need to engage fed states and ngos it's like well, well you just forgot tribes again and we just talked about this two minutes ago and and i think that people just uh, the education systems in america uh which is one of the reasons why i was so excited about daniel uh, Wildcat being on here um, is um, 
is uh, they, they just have that so deeply ingrained in today's society that, that uh, Native Americans are, are a part of history, not a, heart, a part of, of, of the current dialogue. Um, that, that um, you know, it, it's going to take a lot of work uh, for people to, to bring that to the forefront of their minds. So I, we promise on this show to do more about this topic of Native Americans and how we can uh, pay more attention. And we're very grateful to you for your time. And I'm grateful to my students for having organized this and, and, and the, the fact that they're paying attention matters. So thank you very much. And we want to thank our audience. We'll be back tomorrow night with another episode at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, thank you to Bill and thank you to uh, our students for uh, all the work they put in. Jonathan is in the background. Jonathan and Cameron in the background as producers and our co-hosts, Nikki and Kelly. So thanks very much, everybody. And everyone, please follow Bill. He's on Twitter. You can find him on, on Twitter as uh, Cultural Fire, at Cultural Fire. Kelly is Kelly ALV4, and Nikki is Nikki Reports. So thanks very much, everybody, and we'll say goodbye.